Good evening once again everyone, this is Hell's Unicorn and this will be the second installment of Larissa McComas setting the record straight. In my previous installment I had basically gone through a litany of information that I had received uh, via a particular source uh, by the name of David Keeter who was personally involved with Larissa during the course of her career and her life starting in the early to mid 90s. Now what I intend to do is to begin to lay out the evidence and thus to present a case for the actual circumstances of the latter years of her life and also her death. And to start with, I will be confirming what I had stated previously about having heard Larissa McComas's voice on David's voicemail. The following clip that is about to play is an interview that Larissa did during a photo shoot with Penthouse Magazine. The clip is approximately 45 seconds in length and it will be immediately followed by the voicemail greeting that I was able to extract and to record and touch up a bit uh, for purposes of publication on this video. And I did have, I did acquire full per, uh, permission from David to use the voicemail greeting. With regards to the fragment from the interview with Penthouse, I have not obtained permission for this, but I claim it under fair use for purposes of journalistic and educational endeavors. So here is the clip of the interview. This morning I woke up and there was no hot water and I had to walk to three different bathrooms wet and cold to take three different ice cold showers searching for a warm shower. So that part was definitely not easy. <laughs> I have to admit, that was the most difficult part of the shoot, <laughs> was taking a cold shower. I was a Playboy lingerie cover model at a penthouse centerfold. I've starred in over 25 feature films for HBO, Showtime, Cinemax, pay-per-view. I've got stuff on USA Channel. I've done modeling for swimwear calendars, Venus Swimwear Magazine. I don't know, that's a good question. What do I like about this business? I, I like I like to be in front of people. I like to perform. Okay, and that was the interview that Larissa did with Penthouse Magazine during her photo shoot, which I believe took place in either 1998 or 1999. So at the time, she was roughly 28 years old. And this interview definitely gives you a pretty good idea of how lovely a person she was and also how much poorer of a world we are for not still having her in it. If you feel that you need to, definitely go back and listen to the interview again so you can get a pretty good idea of what her voice sounds like. I'm now going to be playing the voicemail clip, which is roughly 10 seconds in length, that I was able to obtain off of David Keeter's phone. When you listen to this clip, take into account that this is a pretty raw voice clip and that uh, voicemail recordings are generally not of as high of a quality as digital video or even Betamax video that's been edited and cleaned up. I did the best I could to clean up the audio so that you could get a pretty good idea of what the voice sounds like, but there are some distortions and discrepancies that have to do specifically with the flaws of the, uh, the first recording that was done with a, a flip phone, basically an old uh, mid-2000 cell phone. And here is the voicemail clip. Hi, this is Larissa and Dave. And we're on available to take the call right now. If you'll just leave your name and your number, we'll be right back with you. Thank you. Bye. All right. So, from my opinion, this was assurance enough that David Keeter knew Larissa personally, that her and David were living together and that what he has told me thus far has been the truth. There are other additional factors to consider also that further bolster this case, such as testimony from Larissa McComas's Aunt Phyllis, which I have also obtained, uh, stating that they did indeed know each other and lived together. Now with all of that established, I'm going to share some additional information that will also serve as evidence for the claims that I made in my previous video. And these will include two letters that were written by Larissa 
to David during the period that he was incarcerated in federal prison on bogus gun charges. There are several things to take into account with regards to these letters, and I have provided a link in the description to a web page that deals with handwriting analysis and comparison, its limitations, and its different properties. Suffice to say, these two individual letters were written at different periods within uh, the time that Larissa and David were separated. One was written early during their period of separation when Larissa was still in pretty good shape in terms of dealing with her Oxycontin addiction. The second letter was written one month before she passed away and during that time she was going through a lot of emotional and physical stress which I'm going to get into a little bit later. But I am going to start off now by reading the first of these letters and I am also going to be posting an image of the letter handwritten on the screen. So when you listen to this it would be a good idea to maximize the video so that you can get a clear visual of what the handwriting looks like and you can make a comparison between the two letters and then after I've concluded reading each letter I'm going to give some additional thoughts on them. So now starting with letter number one. Dear Dave, hello sweetheart I miss you so dearly I wish our phone calls didn't have to be so short. Most of the time I have no privacy to tell you the things I want because other ears are listening. But I dream of marrying you, my man, and having a family with you. Our beautiful Victorian home with lots of land, my brother, and Tristan. We have to do something with Doug, of course. But having our own business, I love the idea of the store, of Larissa's lingerie, videos, makeup, etc. Maybe even glamour boudoir photography and modeling classes. I have a lot of good ideas. I have been thinking about it and we could do so much with using my name and connections. It would be so much fun to teach my own modeling and acting classes. We could offer boudoir photography where women could get beautiful photos, sexy style for their husbands. I can do their makeup and show them how to pose. Then we have a tudic offering videos and lingerie. I think your ideas, with your ideas, we could do so much with this store and studio. It would be awesome. I also want to finish my, finish my college degree so I can teach kindergarten. We could have a beautiful life together. I can't wait until you get out and we can get on our feet. You are my man. We were just meant to be. I am here in your hometown just waiting and waiting for you. Please let me know what is going on with your case, baby. I miss you. I am dreaming of you and our life together as a family with Tristan and a Dave Jr. or two. I will love you always and forever. You will be mine. My kiss to you, my darling. Love, Larissa. During my several phone conversations and also uh, through my various email exchanges with David Keeter, he relayed to me that Larissa had essentially turned down an offer to move back to California and to get back into her acting career at some point between 2005-2007 before he was taken away by the ATF and she wanted to stay in Waverly, Virginia with David, start her own business finish her teaching degree and have a quiet normal life with her true love. For those of you that know part of the story and have not heard this part yet, which most of you most definitely have it because I think this is the first it's been published, this obviously adds an additional level of tragedy to what has come about. I'm sure there are many in my audience that disagree with several of the career choices that she made as a younger woman, but when all of this was revealed to me, what I heard was 
a woman that deserved a happy and long life and didn't get it. Moving on now to the second letter, the one that was written one month before her passing. Before I read this, I should begin by stating that this letter, its authenticity due to some variations in the handwriting is difficult for me to prove apart from David's word. And I've had a couple of discussions with Larissa's Aunt Phyllis on this, and she doubts the authenticity of the letter. So I am publishing this letter at David's request, but I am taking into account that Larissa's aunt has some reservations about it, and thus I think it is necessary to share that with all of you. Part of what is on the website that I linked in the description is some caveats about the flaws in the science of handwriting analysis and comparison and how such things as meaningful comparisons between uppercase and lowercase letters or the fact that drugs, exhaustion, and illness can significantly alter a person's handwriting have to be taken into account with this. And I would actually argue that these caveats do lend a possibility of authenticity because during the time that this letter was written, Larissa was going through withdrawal pains. I don't have anything confirmed for sure because there are no eyewitnesses, but David's speculation is that this is because that Larissa's brother, older brother, Rennett, was stealing her methadone prescription to get high with and replacing the pills in her prescription with placebos. And as stated in my previous video, the withdrawal symptoms from having a very acute painkiller addiction that you are trying to come down off of if you try to go cold turkey are really intense and really extreme. And they can indeed alter a person's psychological being to the point where handwriting can become very garbled. Nevertheless, here is the second letter written by Larissa to David at some point in October of 2009. Dear Dave, things are really not going well for me. I am sweating, running fevers, and turning black and blue. I asked Doug to buy one of those little portable throwaway cameras which cost about $8.99 for me. But because of the severity of the medical negligence, I think it should be recorded and he started yelling at me that he didn't have 899 for that. But he does have the $25 for a $50,000 life insurance plan. What kind of evil is that? He is so evil he doesn't give two shits about me. Never has and never will. I hate him so much. I look like someone is beating me with a baseball bat. I can't even get an MRI to see what's going on inside, and Doug is so goddamn cruel and selfish, he won't even buy a little camera so I can do pictures of the hideous mess of medical negligence I am enduring. It is so severe how much I am suffering that I am afraid I am losing my life here. I am screaming out for help from everyone, and everyone just tells me to be quiet. They don't feel like hearing about my suffering. I'm dying being crushed alive and it is so 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 goddamn painful and no one gives a goddamn about it except for you and my brother it is unbelievable to me how evil Doug has turned out to be he does not care that they are killing me I should send you my journal of what's being done to me you write the movie for Jim Wynorski he wanted it Specifically, if they kill me, which it is looking that way. I'm not exaggerating. I can barely write my hands are too weak. Dave, you do the story. I am sending you my journal. This hell needs to be told. What they do to innocent people. It was inhumane. I love you, Dave. My hands hurt so bad I cannot write anymore. Love, Larissa. Regarding the 
cryptic nature of the people that Larissa is referring to in this letter as causing her harm through negligence. David Keeter has basically speculated that Larissa was of the belief that the doctors whose uh, care she was under for her Oxycontin addiction and who were addiction and who were prescribing her methadone to ease her off it were messing up her prescriptions and that they wouldn't listen to her when she was telling them this. And the reason most likely was because the doctors were not messing up the prescriptions, but that Rennet, her brother, who she trusted way too much, according to David, and I've gotten a similar impression from Aunt Phyllis, although I haven't gotten this in so many words from her. Larissa's letter testifies to the fact that she is of the opinion that her brother cares for her deeply, and David's testimony, given that Rennet lived in the same house with Larissa and Dave for a time before David was taken away by the ATF, that this was not necessarily the case, and that Larissa's good-natured, trusting personality was not serving her well in this. The same is true in the case of Doug. The reason why Doug was even a part of her life anymore was because she didn't just want to leave him with nothing after the house had been lost down in Melbourne, Florida. The combination of this perception with the effects of the withdrawal pains basically explain why the letter sounds incoherent. And to bring everyone's attention to the ending of this letter. David Keeter was to be entrusted with a journal that Larissa had been keeping through the course of the time since David had been taken away. This journal has not been recovered. It is believed by David that Doug is either in possession of it or that he destroyed it because of potential incriminating evidence. The letters that I have shared with you are letters that David Keeter tried to take to the Waverly Police Department in order to reopen the case that was closed several years ago and ruled a suicide. The Waverly PD was not interested and in the past three times that I have called them to request a copy of the incident report, it has basically been my impression that they, they either don't care about this at all, or more likely that they're covering their asses for incompetence. I am still working on trying to get the incident report from the Waverly PD, and I am now of the opinion that they are stonewalling me. And so the next time that I speak with them, after I've written yet another letter that I doubt I will get a response to, I will ask them whether or not the incident report has been sealed. And if it has, I will ask who has sealed it, although I don't need to ask because only one person would have any interest in sealing the incident report. And in that event, I will be seeking legal recourse in order to get my hands on the incident report. That means somewhere down the line, I may end up in a courtroom arguing against those who are supposedly entrusted with serving and protecting us to get information that as far as I'm concerned should be open to anyone in the public. The case is closed, so what is there to hide? As I've pondered the facts here, I've grown to better appreciate the ideology that I've accepted 
that very keen distrust of government. And when you look at the facts as they're presented, it's very clear that what happened here was made possible by good old Uncle Sam and his various affiliate police forces, namely the ATF, but others also, which I will probably delve into at some later date. I don't want to go too long on this. I've already gone pretty long. The government that we have only does one thing well, it seems, and that is destroying. And they played their part in destroying this woman. They took David away from her on a misdemeanor straw purchase that he was not aware of happening, and they put him in prison for almost five years. Left her alone with nobody to go to, although if you want to be technical, she could have sought help from her family and her aunt, but according to Dave, pride got in the way of that. She didn't want to go to them for help as the drug-addicted mess that she saw herself as being. Or at least that's what David has told me. This rabbit hole will continue to go deeper, and I will continue to dig until I get the whole story, and then I get it all to you. It may be a considerable amount of time before part three comes about. It depends primarily on whether or not David has anything else that he wishes to divulge and make public and how things progress with the Waverly Police Department. But the way it looks right now, I could be fighting with them for a couple of years before I can get the full documented facts of what they know and apparently what they don't want me to know or all of you for that matter. I'll keep on this, and when I know more, and I'm cleared by David to tell you, I will. With prudence to myself and benevolence to all of you, good evening.